have a very peculiar case that's going to leave you flabbergasted and very confused. Here goes. Okay, Nicholas Patrick Barkley was born on, on December 31st, 1980 to Beverly Dollar Hyde, who was the youngest in his family, with an older sister named Carrie and an older brother named Jason. The family resided in San Antonio, Texas, where Nicholas was known for being troubled. Now, for the most part, 13-year-olds are normally high-headed, as we all were at that age. But even with that in consideration, Nicholas wasn't exactly considered a good kid. But it depends on your version of a typical American bad kid to be. He was occasionally physically violent or verbally abusive toward his mother, and police had been called to the house to calm him down a number of times. He often skipped school and was usually in trouble whenever he actually went to school. And he already had a juvenile criminal record, having stolen a pair of shoes, threatened one of his teachers, and broken into a convenience store, allegedly. He also had three illegal tattoos, which had pretty much been carved into his skin with an unsterilized sewing needle by another kid, probably around his age. You see, Nicholas was about four to eight inches tall and about 80 pounds. He was just an adorable little thug whom you didn't want to run into in the hallway. This explains why no one took it seriously when Nick Barkley vanished into thin air. On June 13, 1994, Nicholas' mother gave him $5 to go and play basketball with some friends down at the park a mile or two away from their home. He later called to ask his mother to pick him up, but Beverly worked late at night and slept during the day. It was his older brother Jason who picked up the phone and he refused to wake her telling Nicholas he needed to walk. It was the last time they heard from him. Now this wasn't the first time that Nicholas had disappeared. He ran away from home a number of times but always came back within a day. He also had a court hearing scheduled for June 14th, the day after his disappearance, in which it would be decided whether he would stay with his family or be sent to group home for juvenile criminals, which he was opposed to do. Because of this, the police were slow to respond. When the cops finally got the investigation in gear, there was an assumption that with just $5, he could have gotten very far on his own. Spotting him during the search should have been fairly easy as he had been carrying a pink backpack and wearing purple pants when he was last seen. And as far as they found, hadn't packed any other clothing when he left. But within a few days of searching, it was easy to tell that Nick Barkley was gone and wasn't nearby. Beverly Dollahide believed that her son may have just taken a ride from a stranger. Now, oddly, three months later, his brother Jason called the police and told them Nicholas was breaking into their garage. But when police arrived, they were told Nicholas had ran off after seeing that he had been spotted. They searched the neighborhood but found no sign of him. Police believed that Jason hadn't seen Nick at all, but why would he lie about such a thing? Police in San Antonio received a call from a man working in a youth shelter in Lenora, Spain in October of 1997. He had news that was both wonderful and horrifying. Nicholas Barkley was found alive. He had escaped a child sex ring operation run by high-ranking European political and military officials and was believed that he had been abused for the last three years, but he was alive and relatively healthy and during his time in Europe, had even learned French, as well as the basics of a few other European languages. Obviously, the family was overjoyed despite their horror, so his older sister, Carrie, flew to Spain to identify him. At first, Nicholas remained in his room, afraid that she would recognize him. However, to his relief, she quickly confirmed that that was her brother. They then sat together and looked through dozens of family photos. Since Carrie had been told he had forgotten almost everything, she would ask him, Remember, this was the house we lived in before we went missing. Remember, this is when you were playing with Scotty. Gradually, his memory seemed to be returning, and he soon wanted to know if Grandpa was still an asshole, despite remembering Nicholas was very quiet. This hadn't come as a surprise to anyone, given the torture and abuse he had been through in the last few years. Before Nicholas could be sent home, they needed definite proof that he was who he said he was. It was arranged for family photographs that he had never seen before, but taken of 
people he knew to be sent for him to identify. Now, having only made one mistake, he was sent then home to his family and they was overjoyed, of course, to have him back. There was, however, one problem. You see, they couldn't help but question how Nicholas' eyes had gone from blue to dark brown, how his hair had been darkened and his complexion had changed. According to Nicholas, the men and women who ran the sex ring operation had chemically dyed his hair, eyes, and skin to make him look unrecognizable. They believed him. His personality was different. He didn't like to be touched and was very quiet and standoffish. Again, he said it was all because of what had happened. They believed him, but still, distant family members and friends continually pointed out their suspicions, and immediately it was little difficult to believe that this clearly is not how aging works. Come on, people. Later, a private investigator used Adobe Photoshop and pictures of 13-year-old Nicholas and then compared their ears. Apparently, ears are like fingerprints, and an investigator found that they didn't have the same ears. I mean, they didn't have the same anything, but whatever. They got to the right conclusion eventually. After a long stroller and numerous disputes from Nicholas, the family and everyone else who believed his, his story, a court ordered fingerprints and DNA tests to be taken. The result, this was not Nicholas Barclay, but 23-year-old French-born Frederick Borden, <laughs> who claimed to have been raised without any love or affection and has taken on the identities of missing people throughout most of his life and may have had about 500 identities up until now. Nicholas was the first of three missing children whose identity would have been taken over by Borden. During his time as Nicholas, Borden has spread the story of lies about the sex ring, you know, just gathering as much media attention as he could to make Nicholas more real and to make people love him and even more to know what had happened. Despite being told that he was an imposter, the family actually tried to keep Borden in their family, which understandably baffled investigators. Were they crazy, completely convinced that this was Nicholas, or was it something else altogether? And what the hell happened to Nicholas? Actually, Borden himself has a theory on the matter, and it's not a pretty one. Borden thinks the family was convinced that he was Nicholas, but the only person he hadn't met yet was his older brother, Jason. Borden then stated, when he came to see me, he didn't look at me like Nicholas, he didn't pretend to look at me like Nicholas, and he said, good luck to me, and he left. Then, of course, the investigators noted that their view on the family went from being grieving to suspicious. There was no reason knowingly to keep a stranger in their house unless they had something to hide. Borden also stated that they knew he wasn't Nicholas. Borden also said they didn't believe a word that he said, but they were good at not showing it. He also remembered in Spain that Carrie did everything for him. When he didn't know something, she told him, such as say that the house we used to live in, that's my daughter, your niece, do you remember that, remember that, or whatever, over and over again. He also stated that it was like she wanted to put it in his head so he would not forget. You see, she couldn't say that it wasn't her brother. He also said that she knew that he wasn't her brother. She didn't believe for a second that he was her brother, but she decided that he was going to be her brother. Why, I don't know. Now, at this point, investigators then to continue to study the family. They also took note of the phone call Jason had placed to police in September of 1994. You remember that one? According to investigators, this type of thing is not uncommon in murder cases. It's the kind of call made to convince people that someone is alive, in most cases to cover up something. Borden also stated that he believes they killed him or covering it up. You know, uh, probably know the person who did do it. 
and just for some reason choose to ignore it or whatever the case may be. Borden also stated that he and them wasn't worried about Nicholas ever coming back. However, when it was clear that they were going to get away with it, <laughs> you know, and just go along with this impersonation, Borden himself called the police to report Nicholas Barclay murdered. Before he could be questioned, Nicholas' older brother conveniently died from a drug overdose, which may have been intentional. The case has largely gone cold, although private investigators still seem to be actively working on it. It is suspected that there was foul play involved, with Jason as the prime suspect. But unfortunately, he's dead, so we may never know what actually happened to Nicholas Barclay. Tell me your theories below. 